This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The Pakistani army said that it killed 28 members of the Taliban in the Suwad Valley, among them a field commander named Abu Hudayfa. They also arrested seven others during battles in the last 24 hours. The army also reported that five soldiers and two civilians were injured. This comes during a time when the Pakistani streets are divided over the reasons behind the explosions that took place in Lahore and Peshawar. Our correspondent Abdurrahman Matir has more details. Life has returned to normal, or at least that's what seems to have happened in Lahore, in eastern Pakistan, after a suicide attack targeted the headquarters of the main intelligence agency in the city, killing and injuring hundreds of security officials and police officers. A similar attack took place in Peshawar, which has barely recovered from a previous attack where two explosions and a suicide attack happened on the same day. These attacks caused many deaths and injuries and were considered a result of the ongoing war in the Swat Valley. A curfew has been imposed banning individuals from meeting in public places, and we're currently enforcing the law by arresting violators. We do not allow for two individuals to ride one motorcycle. We search cars, and everything's suspicious. This security breach is the worst that has ever been recorded in the capital of Islamabad. The state of alert was elevated, and security measures were strengthened, especially around state institutions and foreign embassies. What has happened and what they fear from recurring explosions has compelled many to stop and think. Is it accurate to only blame these explosions on the ongoing conflict between the army and the Taliban in the western regions? Or are there other entities that want to ignite the situation because they can benefit from it? The lack of security in our country, as evidenced by the numerous explosions caused by the ongoing war in the Swat Valley, means that we have to unite to deal with the situation. Foreign hands are behind the explosions that are taking place and aim to harm Islam and Muslims and weaken the people of Pakistan. Undoubtedly, India and America are involved in all of our suffering, and you are witnessing it. As usual, there are mixed views about the reasons behind what is happening in Pakistan and the anticipated results. However, the lack of security here is preoccupying the people who fear that the explosions could take place anywhere. Abdul Rahman Matar, Al Jazeera, Islamabad. A spokesman for the Iranian June Delay organization declared responsibility for the suicide operation that targeted a mosque in the Zahadani area yesterday. In a phone call to Al Arabiya's office in Pakistan, the spokesman for the group, Abdel Rauf Riji, said that the military operation targeted an election gathering for the Basij forces of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. According to an Al Arabiya reporter in Iran, 19 people were killed in this attack. However, other estimates said that 23 people were killed. The vice governor of Sistan in Baluchistan accused the U.S. of recruiting the perpetrators and said that the three individuals involved in the attack have been arrested.
Until today, the battles in Swat Valley, which have been raging for three weeks, have not ended. So far, little information is available about these battles. Meanwhile, the number of displaced is multiplying. The government reiterated that its forces are advancing and that its forces will continue to take control of one area after another, but that the Taliban has released photos showing that they have control of the major crossings. In addition, explosions have taken place in different Pakistani cities in recent days. السادس عشر من فبراير العام 2009. February 16, 2009, the Pakistani government signs a peace agreement in which the Islamic laws are to be implemented in the Swat Valley and Malakand. April 13, 2009, the parliament approves the Swat Valley agreement. However, in less than one month on May 7, the prime minister announces in a televised speech the beginning of a wide-scale military operation against the Taliban in Swat Valley and Malakand. The shift in the government's position led many observers to believe that the government had planned to carry out this military operation all along. The government only needed time to catch its breath and regroup after two weeks of confrontations with the Taliban forces in the unstable Swat Valley. At this moment, it seemed that Pakistan... At this moment, it seems that Pakistan does not have a clear strategy. The government signed a ceasefire agreement after bloody confrontations with the Taliban, only to revert back to military confrontations. I think that the government knew in advance that it would start such military operations, but it was rushed to do so under foreign pressure, and therefore it did not have the time to be well prepared. The military attacks in Swat Valley are affecting the lives of people in Pakistani cities. After Pakistan declared an open-ended war against the armed groups, all targets became legitimate from the perspective of the Taliban. Confrontations have moved from the Swat Valley and the tribal areas to the heart of Pakistani cities. The operations will take some time. The military operations will take some time. In the meantime, such armed attacks and explosions will not stop regardless of whether we stop the military operations. The government must win the Pakistani people's support for its policies against these armed groups who are trying to use these tactics to influence public opinion in order to pressure the government. There might be a war to win over the Pakistani people, but they are the ones who are paying the price of the war in the Swat Valley, as well as the explosions in Lahore, Islamabad and other cities. The lack of security is now the main concern for everyone, including the president and ordinary citizens. This is a new round of confrontations with the Taliban movement. It will not be the last one, but it reflects a new trend in Pakistani policies that adheres to what the Obama administration calls necessary measures to fight violence, or what the Bush administration used to call the war on terror. These policies, however, have failed to get Pakistan out of its crisis. Bakaratian, Al Arabiya, Islamabad. Iran accused the United States of carrying out yesterday's attacks that targeted a Shiite mosque in the city of Zahedan in Baluchistan, a region in the southwestern part of the country. The governor of the territory, Jalal Faya, said that three people suspected of involvement in the incident were arrested, and it turned out that they were recruited by America. The explosion that took place yesterday as hundreds of worshippers were partaking in evening prayers resulted in 23 deaths and 225 injured, according to new figures that have been announced by the Iranian news agency. Of course, we are broadcasting images from their original sources. Reporting on these developments, our correspondent Rida al-Basha is with us from Tehran. Rida, first of all, what is the basis for the Iranian accusations against America? Dana, of course analysts in Iran are pointing fingers at the United States. However, so far no remarks have been made by any Iranian officials accusing the U.S. Analysts observe America standing behind these explosions because America's actions always conform to their double standard policy towards terrorism and especially issues related to Iran. These analysts say that America turns a blind eye when it comes to some terrorist groups that carry out suicide attacks in Iran. Until now, we've not 
heard of any announcements made by Iranian officials, the Ministry of the Exterior, nor from the Interior Secretary accusing the United States of any involvement. So does this mean that until now the accusations are merely based on analysis? Of course. Until now the accusations are only analysis and assumptions, none of which have been confirmed. With regards to the arrests that were made, is it clear yet who carried it out, what side was behind the attack, or what side is responsible for yesterday's attack? The Iranian accusations are aimed at the Rigi group, whose headquarters are based in Pakistan. Iranian authorities have confirmed that this group is responsible for some of the bombings that came to Iran from Pakistani territories. The Iranian forces demanded that Pakistan surrender the individuals who belong to this group, and they did hand over some of the individuals to Iran. This, in turn, compelled this group to threaten Iran with explosive attacks. Rida Al Basha with us from Tehran. Thank you very much. The recent security development in Iran coincides with the countdown for the presidential elections in which four major presidential candidates are competing. Each one of these candidates, who represent major political parties in the country, is trying hard to promote his political platform and propose reforms. Some candidates have stressed the role played by their competitor, the current president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, in the deteriorating relations with the international community, as well as the economic situation in Iran. reports from Tehran. The presidential election campaigns are getting more heated, thus making it harder for the current president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, to win. It seems that he will need a miracle to win the elections amidst sharp criticism of his government in Iran and abroad. Tensions between us and other countries in the world have increased. I have a program to form a union with southwestern Asian countries and to make our future relations with other countries countries clear. National revenue increased as oil reached $120 a barrel at one point. The question is, how have the people benefited from this increase? Ahmadinejad could not ignore this criticism, which explains why he decided to present his election program on TV, which has become a platform in which candidates are given the opportunity to present their election programs. Despite internal and external pressure and despite the sanctions, we have achieved notable growth in production. The election campaigns included rallies for both reform and conservative candidates. Supporters of reform candidates decided to make green their theme color. Reformers mainly depend on the support of former reformer President Muhammad Khatami, and they also support the most prominent reform candidate Hussein Mosavi to weaken President Ahmadinejad's chances for victory. If the majority of the people participate in the elections, including the supporters of the reform movement led by former President Khatami, then of course Hussein Mosavi will win. There are many different presidential election candidates campaigns, but the programs that each candidate is presenting will be the decisive factor in whether they will win or lose. All roads lead to Rome, and all presidential candidates are trying to reach Tehran in their own way, in the hopes of winning the largest number of Iranian votes in order to reach the presidential palace. Rida al Basha, Dubai Television, Tehran. The damage left by the former Iraqi regime is casting its shadow over the current government, with the Iraqi people left paying the price. The invasion of Kuwait in the early 1990s and the incidents that have followed have caused problems and grievances between Iraq and Kuwait, with the latter rejecting any political or diplomatic solution. Iraq has exerted a tremendous amount of effort aimed at improving relations with Kuwait and solving their outstanding issues. Iraqi members of parliament described the latest decision by Kuwait to keep Iraq subject to Chapter 7 of the UN Charter as unfair to the Iraqi people. Meanwhile, Iraqi Deputy Prime Minister Barham Saleh described his country's relations with Kuwait as historic. Saleh further said that the black political cloud which has persisted over the two countries for two decades will soon disappear. 
Due to fear of Iraq, some neighboring countries do not wish to see Iraq emerge out of Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. We urge these countries to reconsider their decision by supporting Iraq, which has gone through so much. Iraq will not achieve independence and stability unless we secure an exit from Chapter 7. Iraq has met UN conditions contingent to its exit from Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. The trials of the former Iraqi leader and his aides on the crimes they have committed, including the invasion of Kuwait in the early 1990s, is proof of Iraq's sincere intention to establish good relations with its neighbors. Meanwhile, several Iraqi members of parliament have called on the U.S. government to meet its promises and help Iraq exit from Chapter 7. The U.S. must exert diplomatic efforts and use its international weight in the U.N. Security Council to help secure an exit for Iraq from Chapter 7. The U.S. must meet its end of the bargain by implementing what was agreed upon in the security agreement signed between the U.S. and Iraq. Iraq was on its way to exit from Chapter 7. However, Kuwait came along and tried to hamper its efforts by urging Russia to exercise its veto power. This comes despite the progress that Iraq has made, which includes Iraq's efforts to bring members of the former Iraqi regime to trial. For a long time, the former regime posed a threat to world peace and security. From the Iraqi parliament in Baghdad, Dia Rahim Al-Tai, Iraqia. In another development, Iraqi security forces have arrested 30 wanted men and five suspects in a series of military operations, which included raids and sweeps in the Diyala province. Meanwhile, the U.S. forces carried out an airborne military operation in a village northeast of Bakuba, killing two terrorists. The head of the multinational forces in the Iraqi southern provinces, Colonel Philip Battaglia, said that his forces are ready to withdraw from the provinces of Maysan, Dikar, and Muthana, according to schedule. By the same token, Battaglia said that the Iraqi security forces are ready to take over the security responsibility in these provinces. During the time that we have served in the provinces of Maysan, Dikar, and Muthana, we have made major security achievements. We have arrested hundreds of criminals and seized large quantities of various weapons and equipment. We are getting ready to withdraw from these cities according to schedule. The Iraqi armed forces are capable and willing to take over the security responsibility in these areas. In the past three episodes, we talked with the former French diplomat and journalist Eric Rolou, who devoted his life to reporting on the Middle East, the late President Gamal Abdel Nasser, and his personal relations with him. Today, we resume our talk with Mr. Rolou about his personal view about President Anwar Sadat and his presidency. Greetings, Mr. Rolou. Welcome. Did Sadat know that Gamal Abdel Nasser thought about making peace with Israel? Did he understand that? Of course, of course. Even if you were to go to Egypt now and meet with supporters of the Nasser followers' party, you will see this. I have had the opportunity to sit and talk with them. They are convinced that Gamal Abdel Nasser wanted to liberate Palestine. You are referring to Nasser's followers. Yes, the ones who are officially in the party. They are afraid to say that Nasser wanted peace in negotiations. I want to tell you something. Sadat achieved Nasser's objective. Yes, Nasser would never have gone to the Israeli Knesset as a way to reach an agreement with Menachem Begin, but both Nasser and Sadat had the same objective. The two knew that they had to reach an agreement with Israel, one way or another. But Sadat, Sadat was willing to make peace in exchange for the Sinai. This was enough for him. 
He wanted to leave the Palestinians, Syrians, and Jordanians on their own. Sadat knew that Nasser wanted a solution with Israel, too. However, there is a major difference between the two. Nasser did not want to make peace with Israel before resolving the Israeli conflict with the Palestinians, Syrians, and Jordanians. He wanted to resolve all these conflicts at the same time. He considered himself an Arab leader, not just an Egyptian leader. In contrast, Sadat accepted the sole role of the president of Egypt. He believed that if Israel returned the Sinai, that that would be enough for him. So one could say that he prioritized Egyptian interests over Arab interests. Yes. He got bored of Arabs. Sadat never had fixed political ideologies. He was weak in this area. When he was young, he joined the Nazis and expressed sympathy for Hitler. Then he became an Islamist and joined Islamists. Sadat had no fixed political orientation. In contrast, Nasser had fixed ideologies and knew what he wanted to do. He knew what he could do and what he could not. This was probably Sadat's only major problem, and it led to his demise. However, he understood, and perhaps he was right, that he could not play the role of an Arab leader. He knew that he should be modest. He thought if he could take back the Sinai, he would gain popularity in Egypt. This is what ended up happening, and American dollars started pouring in. I remember that when Sadat returned from Jerusalem to Cairo, and I was there, he was welcomed by millions of Egyptians. They were chanting for him. People were saying, now the Americans will give us money and our lives will be improved. There was an illusion about peace. I think that the Egyptians were Egyptians first and Arabs second. Did you meet Sadat before the Camp David agreement? Of course. How did you meet Sadat? Do you remember your first meeting with him? What was your impression of him? Let me tell you, I did not meet with him for three or four years after Nasser died. I did not meet Sadat before 1973 because I had written many critical articles about him. Why? These were my political views at the time. I believed that Sadat was a weak and right-wing politician. I thought that he wanted to make an agreement with America. Did you know this even before he expelled the Russian experts? Yes. How did you know? It was known that he was weak. If you were in Egypt at the time and met with the journalists, intellectuals and others, they would tell you that. They had news from different sources. 128 parliamentary seats are up for grabs in Lebanon. Lebanese television networks are providing wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the election. Are they serving the public? Or do they have favorites? Answers to these questions and more on Link TV's Mosaic Intelligence Report. There is no country in the Middle East as fragmented and full of contradictions as Lebanon. Yet, it is perhaps the most pluralistic society in the Arab world. With a few days left before the parliamentary election due to be held on June 7th, Lebanese emotions have been running high. At stake are 128 parliamentary seats. Competing parties have been fighting for them more fiercely on satellite television networks than in the crowded streets of Beirut. The two principal sides vying for control of the Lebanese parliament are almost equally divided between the pro-Western, pro-Saudi March 14 movement, the current majority comprised of Sunni Future Movement, the Christians represented by the Lebanese forces, and other Christian parties and the Walid Jumbla Druze on one side, and the opposition, the March 8 movement, led by Hezbollah in partnership with the Amal movement, the Talal Arsalan Druze, and allied with Christian supporters of General Aoun on the other. 
To understand politics in Lebanon is to understand the Lebanese satellite television landscape in a small country of approximately 4,000 square miles and 4 million people, with more than a dozen satellite television networks divided, as is the case with the population and government across sectarian lines. Future TV, sometimes referred to as Hariri television, is the outlet of the Sunni community and part of the media empire owned by the late Sunni Prime Minister Rafiq al-Hariri. The Lebanese Broadcasting Corporation, or LBC, projects the perspective of the Maronite Christian community and is run by Sheikh Pierre Daher and owned by a group of Lebanese Saudi investors. Al Manar Television is known as the Hezbollah Channel. The National Broadcasting Network, NBN, is known on the street as the Nabih Berri Television after the Speaker of the Parliament. And the list goes on. Last night, I watched the Lebanese Broadcasting Corporation where a presenter warned that Lebanon might be falling into the hands of Ahmadinejad. Then they cut to Samir Jaja, the leader of the Lebanese forces. You either vote to what Ahmadinejad has said or to what our patriarch has been advising. Jaja said to a room full of supporters. On Hezbollah's Al Manar TV, a guest claimed that the United States has plans to make Lebanon an American protectorate just like Puerto Rico. The show's producers flashed Vice President Joe Biden during his quick visit to Lebanon on the screen. New TV has been playing up the arrest of Army Colonel Mansour Diab, who has been arrested on suspicion of spying for Israel. Stories of Israeli spies in Lebanon have been unfolding on television like chapters from a cloak and dagger novel. Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, called for the death penalty for all suspects convicted of spying for Israel. I call for the enactment of the death penalty on those traitors who gave information that led to all this. Israel is trying to control the outcome of the Lebanese election, an announcer says on NBN television. Meanwhile, Future TV keeps revisiting the assassination of Rafiq al-Hariri. A report in Der Spiegel, a German weekly, has recently implicated Hezbollah's agents in Hariri's murder. Everyone in the West and Israel is asking the question, will Hezbollah win in the upcoming Lebanese election? I called a friend in Lebanon and said, what do you think? Who will win? I don't care, he answered. I'm so confused. I just want to go back to watching regular television programs. I'm Jamal Dajani for the Mosaic Intelligence Report. To learn more about this program or to share your thoughts, visit us at linktv.org slash mir. You can also read my blog on the Huffington Post. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.